the youngest vice president of the country. Kwame Owusu Danso uh, is my guest this morning here on GH Today. Kwame, good morning. Good morning, my brother, Lantom. Welcome. Thank you. How are you doing? Ah, it's been amazing. It's I'm, been I'm amazing. Well, I'm well, yeah, I'm well. I'm, I'm healthy, I'm hearty. Mm -hmm. uh, I can only be grateful mm. for the gift of life um, and the support that we have received uh, across the country. Have so, you settled into your role as Alan Chaman Singh's running mates properly now? Have you settled into it? Well, I think it would take a bit of time uh, because this is a, a new arena. And so as you go along uh, with the, the campaign, it gives you an opportunity to really appreciate the exigencies of now. Mm -hmm. And you juxtapose that with who you are, you know, uh, to see whether or not you are going to move beyond the known cliche of who a vice presidential candidate should be, or you would continue to remain who you are uh, in an attempt to really uh, appreciate the challenges of the people so that you can proffer uh, better solutions uh, for them. So mm -hmm. I am still me. Mm -hmm. I am not trying to take on uh, a cap or put on a cap that it's, it's not me mm -hmm. by reason of this privilege that has been given to me by Alain Chematin. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that to be a privilege to represent um, and be the voice for the young people of this country. And so I just want to stay calm, very humble, do what I've been assigned to do. And in the final analysis, mm -hmm. uh, if the Ghanaian youth really identifies with what I stand for as being their voice, then they will give us the opportunity to come to power. And then I'll continue to further advance the aspirations. Are you able to drum home that message that you represent the youth and that you are for the youth and Alan Chairman Ting's campaign and the plans that he has for this country will benefit the youth. Well, Is I think, that message resonating with the youth of this country? I think so far, we have been able to do that. Um, before my nomination, I think, uh, you know, people really did not understand and appreciate um, the political dynamic of His Excellency Alan Kujochimati. Bringing me into the fold, really opened you know that pandora's box where people now have come to appreciate the reason why he decided to pick a, a young man as his running mate mm -hmm. now i know for a fact that i've appealed to a lot of the younger people in this country uh, people who before now thought that they would not be able to achieve anything in this country people who uh, before now had lost hope and confidence uh, in the system have now, you know, begun to appreciate the possibilities that there exist uh, in this country, particularly if you conduct yourself well as a young uh, Ghanaian, and if you put in the work, you will be able to, you know, achieve, achieve it all. Uh, so yes, I think that my message um, is, is, is being received uh, with open mind. Uh, my message to the young people is rekindling some form of hope and belief in, in, in the youth of this country. And then I can say for a fact also that my message to the youth has given our campaign a little bit of an edge over the other two competing uh, leaders in this race. So mm -hmm. yes, it's been very, very good so it's far. Been very, and you believe that that message has resonated well with the youth. Absolutely. What do you see? Yeah. What do you see? Yeah. You know, that makes you believe strongly that uh, the youth of this country yeah. would rally behind the choice that Alan has made, which is you. Yeah. Um, a young man called into the program right before we even started the segment when mm. I activated the phone lines. And his complaint was about how young people in this country are suffering and struggling to make ends meet and sometimes do not see their left from their rights because of the hardship that they are in. And the demographic of this country there are a lot of young people who are going to be exercising their franchise right yeah so what have you seen in mm. all of your campaigning that makes you think that the youth are rallying behind you mm. well i think it's not lost on me um the very challenges that we all have as young people in this country particularly uh, job creation, particularly the issue of uh, finances, uh, and for young entrepreneurs, the difficulty in assessing uh, funds to be able to start your own businesses. 
Now, the reason why I'm very convinced and have very little doubt in my mind that my message has reson resonated with the young people of this country is the reception that you receive. Um, when you go to the communities, when you go to the ghettos, when you go to the streets, and you begin to engage with the young people, the first point that they make to you is that we don't want to vote this year. Mm -hmm. We are not interested in voting. Yeah. We have had enough of the NDC and the MPP. They have not been able to proffer practical solutions which will address our teeth in challenges. And therefore, we have come to this uh, conclusion that we are not going to vote again. And then I begin to engage with them. I give them reasons mm -hmm. to consider a possibility of having a third you know, leader uh, who is non-partisan, mm -hmm. who will bring uh, these you know, changes that we are looking for as young people of this country. And, and I, again, like I told you, we have sought to dichotomize our campaign in terms of you know, the messaging. So for instance, amongst the youth, we are looking at the formal sector and we are looking at the informal sector. Oftentimes, you have noticed that when these political, big political parties get the platform or the opportunity to serve the people, their primary focus has always been on the formal sector, the people who have been to school, to the neglect of the people who have not had the opportunity of going to school. Now, it is important to acknowledge the fact that whether you have been to school or you have not been to school, you are a Ghanaian. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Now, what solutions are you bringing to address the challenges confronting the people within the informal sector? And that is what we have sought to do. Mm -hmm. So we have sort of segregated our campaign to attend to specific needs of the young people who are in the informal sector and to attend to the specific needs of young people who are in the formal sector. Now, when I go to the ghettos and the streets and I'm discussing with them, I'm not campaigning, I actually have a discussion, a tete-a-tete -tete with them mm -hmm. um, as to what exactly their needs are, even though I know some of them. You know, they tell me the first thing is job creation, the fact that they don't have jobs to do. The second thing is about rent, the issue of rent. Mm -hmm. The third thing is about money, obviously, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and the final thing is their inability to find opportunities in this country to be able to even start their own businesses. Now, having this as a background, and then we engage with the Great Transformational Plan, and then we bring to the fore the very things in the Great Transformational Plan which will address these concerns that they have raised. And I think that these concerns cut across the board. It is not only specific to the young people who live in the ghettos and in the communities. Now, in respect of job creation, for instance, um, for the purposes of better explanation, you know, I would want to look at it from, for instance, the informal sector. Um, now, when you talk about the informal sector, a lot of the young people would want to uh, uh, go into trade. And so how do we help them get into trade and be able to eke an income for themselves to take care of their family members and to take care of you know, their extended family members? So first of all, uh, we are going to create what we call the Traders Bank. Mm -hmm. Now, the Traders Bank is a bank that will be managed and run by the traders themselves. It's like the Agricultural Development Bank, you know, but this one, we're saying that the Traders Bank is going to be managed by traders themselves, of course, mm -hmm. with the support of some retired financial experts and things like that, who will act as a, a, a sort of a support system uh, for the, the traders, so that they manage it very well. Now, government is going to provide uh, seed funding for, for the bank, um, and because day in and day out, uh, you know, the banks are being, you know, resourced, for want of a better expression, uh, by the traders. If the traders themselves have a bank, then they will be able to now do direct business with their banks. Mm -hmm. And in the final analysis, you, you, it will surprise you that even when government needs money to run the, the, the country, they will be able to even provide the funding for government, you know, to, uh, uh, to run the country. Mm -hmm. So what it does is that, if you're a young person and you want to start a business, um, you want to go into any form of trade, uh, you only apply to the bank. Mm -hmm. The bank will assess your, your, your business plan or what you want to do, the model that you want to operate with, mm -hmm. and then they will grant you 
the facility without any interest thereof. Uh, because that is the arrangement that government would have. Without with any interest. interest. Yes, no interest at all. The reason being that they will be running the bank themselves. They understand the nitty gritties of, of what their, their business you know, is or what goes into their business. And then they will be able to now have that human-faced approach. You know, to mm. uh, offering those uh, solutions and, and and the help. But how to feasible their fellow, is that? Well, how well, feasible mm, would it be for, yeah. for for there to be a traders' bank? You know, like yeah. you're saying, yeah, you how know, is that is feasible? running and mm. offering loans yeah. without any interest yeah. rates? Well, of course. Whatsoever. I mean, if you look I mean, at how, um, how will that work? Oh, I mean, there are so many um, individuals who started out as granting loans to market women. Mm -hmm. UT Bank, for instance, started yeah. as that. But they had interest. Course, that's what I'm be saying. Because it was business. yeah, so because it was the bank because it was run yeah, because it was run by an individual whose sole aim was to make profit. Now what I'm saying is that this will be run by the traders themselves. So if it is run by the traders themselves, they will be able to offer that help to their fellow trader to be able to expand their business. And mm -hmm. that's what we are talking about. We're not going to this is not a superficial creation. This is something that we have uh, tactically designed to deal with the issue of uh, uh, loan procurement in the area of trade. Mm. And that is invariably going to address the issue of unemployment in, 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 in the informal sector, mm. uh, particularly among the youth. Now, look, it will interest you to know that uh, in one of my uh, 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 ghetto uh, outreach. I engage with some ladies. Uh, they live in Kios. And then after engaging with them, one of the young ladies came to me and said, oh, she had a baby. Uh, said, oh, please, I wanted to start uh, this Kusuyanu Moko business. Uh, but can you assist me with 200 Ghana cities? She only needed 200 Ghana cities to start the business. And she didn't have, you know, that money. Of course, I had to come to her aid. But this is what I'm talking about. That if you have Traders Bank, mm -hmm. obviously it's mm -hmm. not going to be a centralized system. It's going to be a decentralized system mm -hmm. where people can freely walk in and seek for help to be able to start businesses. Once you make your money, you pay the facility back mm -hmm. so that other people can get the opportunity to uh, also, you know, get funding. But now, you're saying this is this is a bank which is going to be run by the traders. Yeah, it's going to be. Yeah, so but I'm saying that with the support. How is, how is that going to? Work? But how do we run banks? Mm. Uh, we run banks as banks. I don't know what kind of explanation you want me to no, give. No, you to said you it should be run by the traders. Themselves. Yeah, it's run by the so traders themselves. Of who course. are we putting they, you know, yeah. at the helm and all yeah. of that? No, are we so that would be determined by the traders. Bank or is going to be a general bank and all of that? Yeah, so that's, that would be determined by who runs the bank will be determined by the, the traders themselves. In mm -hmm. every catchment area, mm -hmm. they have their own traders' association. They will be able to determine who can best run their business for them. But of course, like I told you before, that we are going to have. Uh, people with financial uh, expertise to be able to provide that financial support mm -hmm. in terms of how they can well structure the bank and run uh, the bank for, for the purpose of making profit for themselves so they can use the profit to also provide some uh, loan mm -hmm. facilities so, to their own traders. You know, how, how, um, how is this you know, better than some of the other propositions that uh, your, your opponents have made? You know? Which is the Women's uh, Bank. Yes, the Women's Bank. Uh, I think the MPP also has a certain fund that they want to set up. Already we have uh, institutions like Maslock existing and all of that. How is this you know, better than all of you know, those, mm. those other models? All those models, for instance, the Maslock that you make mention of, yes. is run by government. Mm -hmm. It is not run by the stakeholders themselves. The difference here is that we are not going to run a government where we will be sitting at the Jubilee House taking decisions for people who understand their sector better than us. So we're going to have stakeholder engagement with the people who are direct beneficiaries of the policies that we are going to introduce. And therefore, the difference here is the active participation of the people who are going to be the direct beneficiaries of the policy that we are going to introduce. And so that's the difference. I mean, uh, and the Women's Bank is bank specific in terms of the beneficiaries. So they are talking about only women being the beneficiaries of the bank that will be created by the NDC. We are talking about the Traders Bank that will benefit each and every one of us, whether or not you are a man, woman, uh, uh, young, old, is going to you know, solve uh, uh, problems for everybody. It's not going to be specific to women alone. And that is the difference here.
And that makes eyes superior to the other ones that you are talking about. Mm. So in, in all of this and trying to appeal to the youth and in trying to get the youth, you know, to, to rally behind you, um, I'm taking a look at uh, some polls, uh, right. some polls from the Global Info Analytics uh, yeah. that they recently put out. And they say uh, this is the presidential election poll as of uh, the 4th of November. Right. And a lot of people seem to be gravitating and seemingly a lot of you seem to be gravitating towards one of your opponents. Uh, mm. Mm. Uh, the polls put him at 4.1 percent mm. of the votes and they put Alan Tremantin mm. at 2.3 percent. Is mm. this something, you know, that you look at? But how did you come your, to the conclusion your, that it is the campaign. youth? How did you come to the conclusion that is the youth that... Is gravitating towards the Nakwami Bidia. No, I'm this, talking about. Yeah, because so, so if you're generalizing, I'm talking about the numbers, I mean, but the point must right? be not necessarily the, the youth. I'm yeah, talking about the yeah, polls, you yeah, know. And but, yeah. a lot of young people seem yeah. to gravitate, you yeah. know, towards. Well, well maybe on media. social media. But the point right, I'm trying to let me, so, let me let me let so me make how, this point. How is how do you feel about some mm. of these polls? I have look. I'll be very candid and frank with you, and I think I've said it elsewhere that I don't believe in polls. Okay. Why? To the extent that it is legitimate, we may consider it, mm -hmm. all right? But you and I do know what informs some of these polls. Uh, ben Epson, you know, they, over the years, posters and things like that. Look, I am saying that the real, the people who are supposed to be our posters are the Ghanaian people. And if you, what's the sample size? Where did they conduct this poll? Which mm -hmm. region did they go to? All these things are unbeknown sample to us. Sample size now, of 2,568 yeah, 2000. votes we are, nationally. We are the, we margin are, of error plus or minus 1.9. Granted, that's the sample granted size. we are 33 million in this country. Yeah. I think the, the voter uh, population is around, it's around 18, 18 million. million. Yeah. All right? So if you do 2,000, what's that? it's not even a fraction of the 18 million that we are talking but about. That, but that's that the, not how that's polls beside, work. Yeah, but that's I mean, research everywhere but is conducted with a sample. Is it, is it region is specific? Is it region specific? Yes, in every region. Is it? Across all, it across can't all, be true. That's what I'm telling regions. you. I have been to the nook and cranny of this country. I have been to villages. I have been to communities. Nobody knows most of the, even Dr. Baumia, mm. most people in the villages don't know who he is. Mm. I am telling you for a fact. So when you, when they sit in their rooms and they conduct these polls, I find it laughable. Mm. I am saying that if we are very patriotic, mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that we deepen our democratic experiment. We must conduct ourselves in a manner that will give confidence to the people who are active partakers and players in this exercise. Mm -hmm. We don't have to conduct ourselves in a way that will create the impression that somebody has been paid to conduct a survey to support another candidate. We don't do that. Is that what you believe? Now, let me tell Is you. Is that what you believe? Let me tell you. Poll, I mean, well, I mean, that's their poll. My poll, my poll, my poll, my poll is that... To <laughs> make it look favorable. I can, I can also... This is my poll. I'm also conducting the poll mm -hmm. to tell you that that's what it appears to me. That, you know, we intentionally do these things just to crash out some candidate mm. in... This. How so you lend any credibility you, to these polls that have been put out? Alan Chemate's credibility precedes him. You know this. Under no circumstance, if you compare, and that is why well, well, I am so saying that. The credibility of Alan Chemate yeah. will not be in dispute. We, we, we're talking about yeah, but, what but, the numbers but why do are people with regard vote? to how people feel about the upcoming it's, election and who they are likely the, to the vote level for. Of, so that's what we're talking yeah, about. The, le the level of despondency is, not, is, is unquestionable. Mm -hmm. All right? And that has led to some apathy. People are saying that they are not going to vote. Okay? Now, why do people vote? People do not vote on the basis of just being frustrated. Mm -hmm. People vote on the basis of the policies and the promises that political parties give to them or make to them. And that is the reason and the basis for people choosing a leader. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the NDC and the MPP, for instance, right? These two political parties have had the privilege... Now, I quite describe it as such. Privilege of governing this country uh, for 32 years, 16 years apart. 1992 to 2000 NDC, 2000 to 2008 MPP, 2008 to 2016 NDC, 2016 till date MPP. Mm -hmm. So no other political leader has had the opportunity to govern the country apart from these two political parties. Yeah. What, have we, what has been the benefit to the good people of Ghana. We have not benefited from these two political parties. And so it is understandable that a lot more people will be frustrated, that a lot more people 
may want to, you know, see the system changed. But I can assure you that what is being represented here is not a true reflection of what is on the ground. Mm. And, and uh, precisely what happened in the American election. Mm -hmm. People were predicting left, right, center. Yeah. People always go with the flow. If people think that the wind is going to blow a certain direction, mm -hmm. then they all gravitate towards that. So it's perception, it's mind games. Right. Now, we do not want to fall for that. We are very laser focused on the kind of campaign that we're doing. We're doing retail campaigning. We are going to the homes of people. We are going to ghettos. We are going to villages. We are going to communities. We are going everywhere to speak to the people and give them a reason to throw away the NDC and the MPP. So all these things that you are seeing is just to you know support that which people think should happen. It's like um, uh, Burton, for instance, mm -hmm. when people Manchester and Chelsea are playing uh, you know a game. People will naturally maybe gravitate towards Manchester United if in that particular season, Manchester is performing very well. So they will place their bet on Manchester United. It doesn't necessarily mean that they believe in Manchester United. They are supporting Manchester United because in the final analysis, everybody is saying Manchester United. And that is what happens. But you see, elections have consequences. Elections are not like sport betting. When you are going to vote, your thumb is yours. But the repercussions after you vote is for all of us. And therefore, we must always be minded and guided by the decisions that we make. We must not make decisions based on some polls which have been conducted by people. We must make decisions on the basis of the experiences that we've had over the period with, with these two political parties, which experiences have not helped the good people of Ghana. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is time for us to begin to look outside the box. Let's look beyond the peripheries of the entrenched geopolitical political system that we have been operating for the past 32 years, which have not yielded any positive results. To go for a leader who is forward-thinking, a leader who is youth-centered, a leader who thinks about the aspirations and the needs of the Ghanaian people. That is what is going to be the ultimate decider in this year's election. And not by some poll conducted by any other person because they want to just, you know, appeal to the conscience of the good people of Ghana. Look, let me tell you something. This perception that Ghanaians are gullible, that Ghanaians are vulnerable, is a perception that does exist. Mm -hmm. And therefore, people mean, look, as I speak to you now, people are undecided. And they may well decide to vote for one party or the other on the basis of these things. When you do this, you are not helping the country. Mm. When you conduct polls, which polls do not reflect the exactitude on the ground, you are not helping the So you're not seeing any poll that you believe reflects what the reality but on the you ground are, is. But you are you a seasoned journalist. Seen, you've not seen any Nantam, poll you are a seasoned that journalist. you believe you know, reflects. I mean, Global Info Analytics have uh, been conducting polls for quite some time now. Yes, and, and have they all been, been, always they've not, been they've accurate? Not been, they've not been far from accurate. Oh, far from some accurate. Of, some yeah. of them have been pretty accurate. Some of them, yeah. but not all of them. Most of them have been pretty well, accurate. Well, most of them, but not yeah. all of them. Or close to what they predicted. Well, close to, but not... I mean, they've garnered some credibility. The difference so, here. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm just asking yeah. you know, whether or not also, regardless of you know what you think about these polls, you take it into consideration and try you know and do some work around some of these perceptions, you know, as you put it, mm. in order to boost your campaign. Well, I mean, or look, it's something that you completely disregard. I mean, to the extent that our campaign is a retail campaign, to the extent that. We've been around the country, right. and we have engaged with, directly with the people. To the extent, extent that the reception has been nothing short of acceptability, mm -hmm. we are very confident and have very little doubt in our minds that our plan is working. Right. And that Honorable Alan Kodjo Chemantin will shock the world because the good people of this country need a leader who is a game changer, a transformational leader who will bring real transformation and change to the good people of Ghana. That is what the good people of this country need. And I'm telling you for a fact that on the 7th of December 2024, you, Lantam, will call me and say, and say Kwame, I, I, you, you told me. Well, I hope so. That's that what is what is going to happen. Mm. That's what is going to happen. Look, people have had enough. I'm... 
in the villages, even in the villages. So how do you convince the yeah. people who have had enough? Because yes. you, you talked about the fact that some of these polls also are likely to influence certain people who are mm. undecided because they believe mm. that perhaps there's a particular candidate who mm. is in the lead mm. and it doesn't help. And there are people who are tired of the duopoly of the MPP and the NDC, yeah. right? And of course, these are some of the voters that you really need to bring and even try to convince some of them who are MPP and NDC, you know, to come on board and vote for Alan Sherman thing. So what do you tell the person who believes that, well, if I vote for Alan, you know, I mean, it's like I'm wasting my vote because mm. he may not win anyway. Mm. What do you tell somebody who yeah. has that perception? Yeah. So, they're tired, so, but they, yeah. they still want to vote. So, so, you, you, so you're tired. Yeah. You don't want to vote. Yes. Okay? Um, and when you vote for Alan, you are wasting your vote. I think it is rather the opposite. When you vote for the NDC and the MPP, you are wasting your vote. You know why? Because you have been voting for them consistently without fail from 1992 till today. The only person who has not had the opportunity of leading this country is Alan Chemate. Mm -hmm. The only reason why, in my estimation, people naturally may want to gravitate towards the NDC or the MPP is because Ghanaians have not had the opportunity of tasting good leadership from somebody who is not part of the duopoly. Mm -hmm. Now, when we are presented with an opportunity to test the governance style of His Excellency Alan Kodio Chemate, then we'll be able to do proper comparative analysis. Then we'll be able to say that, oh, the NDC was better. The MPP was better. Movement for change is worse. But now you are compa comparing two political parties mm -hmm. which, in my estimation, have been engaged in a cycle of incompetence that you have had op an opportunity of governing this country for 16 good years. Osage Foto Takwame Nkrumah only had but six years mm -hmm. and was able to transform this country. So if you don't get that kind of leader who is futuristic, mm -hmm. a leader who thinks beyond the borders of his nose, and a leader who thinks about the generation yet unborn, mm -hmm. will, be, will, will, will be consumed you know, by, by, the, by the system. What do you think and, the problem and, has and, been? What yeah. do you think, in your estimation, what do yeah. you think the problem yeah. has been with yeah. regard to our leadership that we've yeah. not been able to do some of the things that Kwame Nkrumah was able yeah. to do? Uh, yeah. That we, we seemingly yeah. are marking time. Yeah. Uh, what has been the leadership the leadership problem in that I, I, regard? The, 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 Especially the, the, with the duopoly. Yeah. We had some military regimes and then we entered the democratic yeah. era, the Fourth Republic, and now we've had a duopoly since. Mm. What has been the problem? I, I think it's just this lack of patriotism shall I, because if you if you are very patriotic and you are Ghanaian you see yourself first as Ghanaian and not as a party person then you'll be able to you know bring the change the desired change that we all we all are desperately looking for oftentimes because of the winner takes all syndrome mm -hmm. when MPP wins they yeah. want to cater to the needs of their people yeah. to the neglect of all of us because check this Lantam we are a country of 33 million. Now, if you look at the statistics, about, let me just even say, 1 million belong to MPP, 1 million belongs to uh, NDC, right? Now, if you take out the 2, which is 2 million, you get a population of 31 million. So, the 31 million who are Ghanaians mm -hmm. must also benefit from the government. But in many uh, cases, you notice that when they win power, if you, are, if you belong to another political party, you do not get the opportunity, even with all the expertise that you have, to serve in the administration of the party that is in, is in, is in government. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, people forget that we do not have the president of the Republic of MPP or NDC. We have the president of the Republic of Ghana, mm -hmm. which translates to mean that after elections, you have to unite the party, mm -hmm. the, the country, so that everybody can help, you know, uh, uh, develop the country so that in the final analysis, all of us will benefit. Now, the difference here is that the Ghanaian people have not been presented with an opportunity to experience another leader. And that is why I come back to that same point. Now, a leader who is going to bring about a government of national unity, mm -hmm. where we are going to pick experts from NDC, MPP, CPP, GH1, GTV, wherever, insofar as you have what it takes 
to assist the government succeed for the benefit of the Ghanaian people, we are going to invite you to support our government so that we can do that for the Ghanaian people. That is what we need. So you say because Alan is an independent candidate, a non partisan, a non partisan independent candidate. Everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Beyond, and beyond. The winner takes all. You know, we are going to do away with this winner takes all syndrome. It I'm telling you. The bane of the country. Now we have been given uh, Ghana cards, but the real beneficiaries of the system are the holders of the party cards. Think about this. Mm. So we have the Ghana card, but the people who are close to getting jobs are the people with party cards. Does it make sense to you? Are we not all Ghanaians? Why must somebody suffer by reason of not voting for another political party? Why? We are so consumed in this, you know, thinking that automatically, I have to belong to a certain political party to be able to succeed. And that is why this duopoly ought to be broken. Mm -hmm. That is why we need to break the, 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 the duopoly. So, so Alan is someone who is independent. Yeah. Right? Has he been able to shake off the tag of, well, he was part of this government, mm. and a lot of his achievements in his political life has been with the system mm. that you are trying to approve, mm. right? the establishment from President Kofor mm. to President Akufuado. Has Alan been able to shake off, you know, that, that target, mm. that perception that mm. people may have that, well, mm. I mean, he's, he's mm. coming from these folks, so yeah. he's not really... Yeah. He's, he's not I, really I, I believe he has. You know, there's this proverb in Chi. Mm -hmm. It says, uh, You can't argue. Mm. He was part of the system. Yes. He's noticed that this system is retrogressive. Mm -hmm. He's noticed that this system is stifling the youth he's not noticed uh, that uh, this system is not giving opportunities uh, to young people to be able to demonstrate what they have uh, 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 in terms of their expertise to enable uh, the Ghanaian people benefit he's noticed all of that he's noticed that we are running a system where we may get to a point where now the country will be divided on the lines of extreme partisan politics right and so this is the best time to unite all of us. Now, when someone like that comes out to say that I have created a movement for young people, I have created a movement for non-partisan people, I have created a movement for all Guineans <clears throat> to be able to now be active players and partakers in shaping our collective futures, <clears throat> then I think that this is a man that we must support. Similarly, when Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was in, invited into the country by UGCC. He was a member of the UGCC. Going forward, he noticed that the path to independence was bleak, mm -hmm. and it was bleak under the UGCC. Right. What did he do? He needed to take a step back mm -hmm. from CPP and bring independence to the good people of Ghana. Right. I think that it is symptomatic of what has transpired relative to the Alan story, mm -hmm. that he was part of the system, that he's noticed the flaws in the system, mm -hmm. that he's taken a step back, that he's formed movement for change, that he, perhaps, is the one who is going to bring us our second independence. I mean, you've been in the seats that I'm sitting in before, you know, yeah. talking to a lot of politicians over the period, right, from MPP, from NDC, from CPP, from wherever, right? And now you are in that arena with them, so to speak, you know, campaigning, trying to get people to vote for Alan Chairman Ting. What have you, or what, what, what has been your experience in that regard, you know, vis-a-vis -vis when you were in the seat of a journalist, asking the politicians all the questions, A, B, C, D, and now you being the politician yourself in the trenches, yeah. doing the campaign and doing the things not those people you're asking questions you yeah. are doing. Yeah. It, well, the, the difference is that it gives you an opportunity to get closer to the problems. Mm. And it gives you an opportunity to assess those problems mm. and to now pull parity with the explanations which have been given by politicians mm. to see whether or not politicians yeah. are liars or the people are the ones who are yeah, not so what, are, so, so what so, has that been? That, that's, yeah, that would have uh, been my follow-up question. Uh, absolutely. But, yes. Now, I would, it, it, go, go it is me. very interesting, Lantam, mm -hmm. that... Uh, the explanations that we are given by politicians, uh, the solutions that they claim to have proffered, 
you know, the, the teething challenges that they claim to have addressed mm -hmm. are still in existence. Now, I went to a place called Akon. I went to a place called, you know, Asan Gregoire. Yeah. You've heard of uh, Diaso. You have, you've heard of Bordier. All these communities that I've, uh, I've mentioned are communities that are supposed to benefit from the country, but they've been neglected. In fact, especially in Western region and Western North, you will weep. All the roads are bad. Mm. All the roads are bad. You get to communities where they don't have potable water, they don't have cheap compounds, uh, they don't have clinics, they don't have schools, they don't have network. Mm -hmm. But they have representation have, in parliament. They have representation in parliament. Mm. We've been to communities where they, in 2024 they don't have light. You know, they don't have light. So a beggar's belief, when these politicians, when given the opportunity, come to sit on TV and radio and then engage in fight, unnecessary arguments, unnecessary, you know, uh, uh, lamentations, mm -hmm. whereas the problem still exists. Accusations and counter accusations. Ac counter accusations. Lantam. I mean, look, the, the, if you know how people are living, have you ever been to a place where you start weeping without, or knowingly, you just start tearing up? Mm. That's how I felt when I went to one of the communities, Lantam. You know, so I don't see myself, I don't want to even be called a politician. I just want to be seen as a Ghanaian. But you are in the arena now. No, so but, you see the, yeah, but I'm a, I want to be seen as a Ghanaian. Because I am not, when you, I don't know whether it is by definition, uh, uh, which makes people, by that definition, which makes people behave the way they do. Mm -hmm. But I think that if I see myself and consider myself as a Ghanaian, I will continue to do the things which will... Uh, further the aspirations of, 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 of Ghanaians and not necessarily do things which will benefit. You see, the, the advantage here is that we are not, we are not um, sort of a partisan group. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we will not do things that will benefit the party. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes, not sometimes, in fact, all the time, when you be, because you belong to a political party, you have to always make sure that you kowtow to the ideals of the political party mm -hmm. to the neglect of what the Ghanaian people really, really need. And so we are going to act and think differently. We're going to do things differently. We are not going to call ourselves politicians, you know, and that's why in the Great Transformation Plan, one of the things which, you know, tickled my, my excitement really was in relation to mindset and behavioral change. Mm -hmm. That you, somebody comes to you to come and beg you for a job. You give them the job. And then they go and sit in their offices and behave as if they were demigods. That attitude ought to change. You know, ministers uh, walking about with their shoulders high, disrespecting the Ghanaian people, uh, not being able to, not picking their calls and, and, and addressing the challenges of the people. Mm -hmm. All these things will be dealt away with when the we are giving them such the arrogance. Yes. In Rwanda, a minister's number is on Twitter. If you like, call the minister, and the, uh, and the minister should refuse to pick. And just send a uh, what's it called a query to the uh, to to the office of the president. That minister will be fired mm. because you are serving the people. That's the difference. You want to bring that, that is, kind. You want to bring that kind of um, but accountability. Lantam, to, to if to, you to the are country. a minister, you are serving the good people of this country. Let's get that clear. You are a servant of the people. Okay. It is with the people's thumb. And that is why you are sitting where you are. It is not with your own thumb. And so when you are given the privilege to serve the people, you must conduct yourself at all material times in a manner that will continue to give people confidence that you are representing them well. That you are trying or attempting to deal with their issues. Mm -hmm. But when you go and you are so arrogant, very disrespectful to the people, and uh, you are not solving their problems for them, then you, you, you have done the good people of Ghana a great disservice. You mentioned that in all of this, you know, when you, you go into the trenches and you go into you know, the hinterlands and the towns, sometimes the things that you see make you want to weep because of the kind of mm. lives mm. that people are living. There's a lot of poverty. Yeah. Recently, you know, there's a, there's, there's a, a report, I think, from the World Bank, which indicates that there are about 30% 
of Ghanaians who are multidimensionally poor, poor mm. in various forms. You know, more people have been pushed below the poverty line due to different factors. And you have touched on some of the things that you have seen. So how does the Movement for Change and the Great Transformational Plan mm. address the issue of poverty yeah. and people who are destitute, people who are struggling to make ends meet, to lift them out of poverty? Yeah. How? Yeah. So, I mean, the issue of poverty is not... Uh, the solution of it is not something that is going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. It will take time to uh, deal with the issue of poverty. But the first point is about creating jobs. Now, what happens is that once we are able to create the jobs that we are talking about, I spoke to you about a few of, I spoke uh, about a few of them, the yes. Traders Bank, Start Your Own Business, the Health Booth, uh, jobs that will be created, Youth in Responsible Mining, the 3 million jobs that will be created, and all of that. There's a trickling down effect. Now, every young person trying to survive in the cities have their families back home. And you know this, that those of us who came to Accra to come and hustle, we are the ones who send something back home. Now, because we do not have jobs to do, which means that we do not have money, we are not able to send monies back home to take care of the, the family members. Now, once we are able to create the jobs and put money in the pockets of, you know, Ghanaians, invariably, automatically, the people within our immediate circle will benefit from, from that. Now, as I said to you this example, you remember when we had uh, the banks thriving very well in this country uh, before they were collapsed by this administration? What it did was that once you complete the university or any of these tertiary institutions, there was an opportunity for you to now get a job in the private sector. Now, when you get a job in the private sector, you are paid. When you are paid, you'll be able to take care of your grandmother, your mother, your kid sister, and all of that, and also save small and build a house for yourself and take care of your nuclear family members. That is what it did for us. But because now we collapsed all the banks, we broke that cycle. Mm. So what we are experiencing now in Ghana is just the upper class and the lower class. Mm. The but middle but class the banks is the have been able to absorb. I mean, it's just, a few, it's just a few people that some of those banks that collapsed. 6,000. You know, yeah, 6,000. 6, 6,000. Yeah, about 6,000. Six, multiply effect. But there are a whole Mul lot of you know, other people who, 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 who are not even in the system already. But who will be disadvantaged mm. by reason of that singular decision? 6,000, multiplying effect. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that is number one. Number two, for our mothers and fathers who live in the rural communities, they always love to farm. Their mainstay is farming. Mm -hmm. Not so. So if we invest hugely in agro-parks, and that is precisely what we are going to do, and we make agriculture very lucrative so that a lot of you know, our rural folks will be interested now to go back into agriculture. They will definitely make money for themselves. Mm. So that is another aspect of it. Now, beyond the agro-parks that we are going to build, it's also the regionalization of developmental projects. That if you look at Greater Accra Region, for instance, we are going to ensure that we have what we call the financial hub in, in the Greater Accra Region. So the Greater Accra Region will cater to the financial needs of the country. When you go to the Ashanti region, it's going to be the industrial hub for the country. Mm. So all the industries, all the factories, and all of those things that will engineer the growth that we are looking for will be situated in uh, Ashanti region. Similarly, when you go to the Western region, we are going to look at you know, the region being the oil and gas and mining hub for the country. So when you do this segregation, of course, and for all the other regions, for, for instance, the five regions in the north is going to be the food basket or the bread basket for Ghana and West Africa. When you go to tea region, it's um, aquaculture and fishing, you know, fishing and aquaculture. So every region has something that is going to, you know, open up that region mm -hmm. so that a lot more jobs will be created. Once we are able to do all of that, jobs will be created, people will have money, people will have the liberty to live their lives mm -hmm. and be satisfied knowing that government is taking care of them the immediate steps this may be long-term 
uh, solutions. But the immediate uh, to medium term, you know, the short to medium term solutions that we, we will be uh, introducing are the things that I've spoken to you about. The first point is to ensure that we have the traders bank. That's number one. The second point is to ensure that we deal strictly with the issue of corruption. Because when we deal strictly with the issue of corruption, we'll be able to save so much money to invest in other areas which will now create more jobs for the young people and, and, and the generality of the Ghanaian people. Mm. The third thing that we're going to also be dealing with is the issue of the health boot that I spoke to you about. Now, the fourth point, which is more like social interventionist uh, approach, but it's going to further help reduce the burden on our mothers and our fathers, particularly those who live in the rural communities. So that is what is going to happen. We call it the GRASP, Ghana Rural Aging Support Program. Now, the Ghana Rural Aging Support Program is going to create a two-pronged solution, uh, 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 solution to the, 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 the challenges confronting our mothers and fathers who are 60 years and above. Now, for those who live in the rural communities, they have not had the opportunity of working in either the private sector or the public sector. Now, the first part of the solution is to provide a national health insurance scheme that is specific to our mothers and fathers who are on retirement from 60 and above, particularly those living in the rural communities. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what it's going to do. Government is going to take care of them, uh, for instance, when they are sick, we'll take care of, of, of uh, the, the cost of the, the treatment. Mm -hmm. We'll take care of the cost of the drugs or the medicines that will be given. Mm -hmm. We'll make sure that they don't join any long queues mm -hmm. because they will have a specialized health insurance card that they will use in order that you know, they can assess quality health care. Right. Okay. And government will bear that cost. Now, similarly, the other part of this uh, Ghana Rural Aging Support Program policy that I'm talking about is in relation to providing some financial aid to our mothers and fathers who live in the rural communities. So every month, the idea is to give those people 200 Ghana cities a month to, to support them, just to support them. Because I've lived in the village, and I know what 200 Ghana means uh, for those of us who have lived in the villages. Mm. So that is precisely what we're going to use, uh, do in order that we can also we give them some level of relief. For them to know that, I mean, when we were young, we worked tirelessly, we contributed to the development of Ghana. Now we are old, Ghana is also what, taking care of us. And that is what we want to achieve with the Ghana Rural uh, Aging Support Program. So when you look at all of this cumulatively, mm -hmm. it leads you to an irresistible conclusion that Alan Chermatin is the obvious choice that we need in this year's election. Now, there's another national security crisis that, in my estimation, is rearing its, its head. And we have not really focused our attention on saying. Mm -hmm. The issue of rent is a big issue, particularly amongst the young people of this country. We have decided that to the extent that there's a law which governs the operations of rentals in this country or rent in this country, we are going to strictly comply with the rules of, 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 of uh, all the, 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 the provisions of the law. Mm -hmm. So that Section 25.2 is telling you that every landlord, insofar as you want to rent your, your, your property, you must not exceed six months. We are going to ensure strict compliance of the law. How? How will you enforce that? Strict because compliance that law of the law has been in oh, existence oh, yes. oh, yes. for a while now. No, enforcement. And, uh, the enforcement has mm. been a problem. Absolutely. Mainly because of the demand and supply issues, Good. right? Yes. The demand far outweighs yeah. the supply. Granted. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, the landlords can... I mean, there are people who are willing to pay one year, two years rent advance. If the other person is not willing to pay mm -hmm. and the other person is willing to mm -hmm. pay, they will take money from the one who is willing to pay. Yeah. So how will you enforce it mm -hmm. when we have a deficit? We have mm -hmm. a serious housing deficit in this country yeah. with demand yeah. far above supply. Yeah. How so, enforcement so, make? so you, you know we have rent controls, uh, control. Uh, yes, we have rent control. Exactly. So how will they now? Work? Exactly. Now, what is going to happen is that first of all we are going to deal with the issue of housing, um, and I think I'm on record to have indicated that you know we don't understand why Saglami housing project is still uh, being left unattended to. Yeah. Now we will address that, but most importantly, we are going to have a system where anybody who intends to rent your house will be registered 
on a platform. Are you following me? So we're going to have a platform where all landowners will have their properties registered with a particular you know, uh, agency that will be set up to have an oversight responsibility of the issue of housing in this country. So we have works and housing, but within works and housing, we'll create one that is specific to rent to ensure uh, that we comply with the, with the rules of engagement. I mean, won't that now, be a duplication of it's the... Not a duplication. Uh, no, works and housing should rent, be focused on... Control. Works and housing. Oh, but works... You see, that's the whole point. Rent control is to ensure that the, the, uh, the people who rent, okay, benefit from... Yeah. What, what and they are being the, supposed to ensure yeah, compliance, uh, compliance. You know, of the, the, the six-month advance so, but, and all of that. So the point that. is that so the test, there's going to be a task force within that structure mm. to ensure that there's strict compliance. That's what I'm, I'm talking about. I'm not saying that we are going to, uh, you know, uh, if you like, extricate or... Right. Uh, yeah, but we are going to have a task force within uh, the, the structure which will have an oversight responsibility on compliance. Mm -hmm. Now, the point I was actually trying to make is that we're going to have a platform where anybody who intends to rent your house will be registered on that platform, right? Now, we will do valuation of all the properties in the country. Now, the valuation will determine the amount of money that somebody has to pay to be able to rent your house. So, say, in my area, there are houses that is going for 1,500 Ghana cities. Which houses, in my estimation, should not go for 500 Ghana cities? But because of the kind of system that we have created, people automatically increase their rents when they notice that they have, you know, in that area, new buildings which have been put up uh, go for those prices. So once we have that system, where if your money is 300 Ghana cities and you go and you click Kwabenya, houses in Kwabenya, then it, 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 bring, it brings out all the houses in Kwabenya. You have houses between... 300 and 500 Ghana cities, 500 and 1,000 Ghana cities, 1,000 and 1,500 Ghana cities. Once you click on it, it gives you options. And then you will select the one that you want. So do I hear you so, saying that yeah. there's going to be an illegality for anyone to rent out a property without registering? It will be an illegality, yes. Agency it will be an illegality. That every if we property don't owner take, must necessarily, you so must. if someone rents anything, you must, you any must. Uh, property out, you, yeah they would have to be registered. Absolutely. Otherwise, it's an illegality. It's an illegality. You must. Look, Lantam, if we don't take these serious steps mm -hmm. in addressing the very basic things in this country, <laughs> we will never develop as a country. Because if we continue to allow the system to operate, we will be the, the sufferers of it. So, to that end, we must all be involved in building our nation. That is what we must do, and that is what we are going to do. Mm. So, in all of this, let's uh, switch our attention to issues that have got to do with the economy, right? Because all the things yeah. that you say you are going to do, of course, will require a lot of money. Now, we are in a, in a situation where the economy is not too good, right? Uh, revenue generation is a problem. Uh, the country is saddled with a lot of debt. And we'll have to take some time, according to economists, to claw back out you know, of these doldrums that we are in. What is the plan yeah. of the movement for change yeah. to, to bring us economic recovery yeah. you know, while trying to implement the lofty you know, things that you want to do, which mm. some of them are very capital intensive? You would agree with me that, and I think this has been something that I've said over and over and over and over again, that one of the major issues confronting our economy, first of all, is corruption. That's the, the number one thing that is affecting our economy. Corruption. The fact that people steal more than they give to the country. That's number one. And we are going to address the issue of corruption. How, How are we going to address the issue of corruption? How? So we are going to address the issue of corruption by introducing what we have described as the anti-independent, anti-corruption czar. And you recall that recently when Trump won, he, he introduced what we call the border czar. The, yeah. Yes, immigration. I mean, the that, that position yeah. has, has yeah. always but been has there. Give, yeah, but gave I mean, it he to, has another but, position but gave it for, by, for Elon Musk and uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. Yes. You know, so, who are going to deal yeah, with yeah, wastage. In wastage, the exactly. Yes. So, our independent anti-corruption czar 
It's more like the special prosecutor, but will have an independent authority, which authority will directly flow from, flow from the constitution, which would mean, of course, there will be some constitutional reform. If we want to change the country, then all of us must comply. Now, once we have this independent anti-corruption czar, that independent anti-corruption czar will deal with all the issues uh, relative to corruption and corrup corruption-related matters. We'll deal with it. The, the reason why be doing? The it will dissolve that office. The special prosecutor's office is not functioning the way it should by reason of how, first of all, the, the special prosecutor is appointed. That power of appointment will be taken away from us, the, 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 you know, his excellency Alan Kodjo chairman saying that is what he has said. And given to an in the, uh, a second chamber of parliament, that will be created for the purposes of making such appointments. So, the independent the second chamber of yeah, parliament. Second chamber of so parliament. You're looking at what? A total overhaul of our democratic We system. have to change the system. We if we want the system to work, we have to change the system. Imagine a system where, of course, parliament will have, they will be doing their job, uh, you know, in, in, in the passage of laws and things like that. Then we have a second chamber that will be focused on appointment, for example, and ensuring that there's some sanity in the system. That will bring us some huge relief. Now, of course, for want of time, I will not be able to go into the nitty gritties of that. But that is what we are going to do to, to, to deal with the... Uh, now, also, the, the, the second point is that we have an issue of production. Mm -hmm. We do not produce anything in this country. We are not an industrialized country. And a country that is unable to produce anything is a country that will continue to borrow. Now, because of you know, the fact that we have a leader who is himself an industrialist and somebody who has a track record of building, this is not going to be difficult at all in building factories and in, in adding value to our produce and in making sure that we export rather than import. Because it is the importation that creates the burden on the local currency. Demand and supply, simple demand and supply issue. You, you, you get the point. Now, first of all, we are going to invest through that, the system that I'm talking about with the you know, infrastructure, industrial infrastructure and all of that. We're going to also have agro parks. Mm. Now, these agro parks will help further advance the gains that we have made in the area of agriculture. That will add value. Because every, the byproduct of every, all of these oil, you know, gas and all those things can be uh, used and transformed so that we can have other products coming out of it. We do not do all those things. All the time, we import, and there's stress and burden on the local currency. I believe that once we are able to produce more, once we are able to create an enterprise economy where everybody will be able to start their own business, where people will dare to be entrepreneurs, we will have monies you know, be generated internally. And that will mean that we will not necessarily have to go to IMF to go and continue to borrow. Because what we borrow, two line items, what, to pay public se sector emoluments and to service the debt that we have gone to borrow before. Mm -hmm. And that is precisely why we are unable to generate enough revenue. Look, last time, somebody was telling me that for the first time, people do not have confidence in even uh, 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 offering assistance to government by way of giving uh, you know, government uh, bonds. You know, all the government-issued bonds have yielded to nothing. You understand what I'm saying? So, I uh, have amounted to nothing. And so, these are but, you know, a, a few of the... I'm not an economist, but based on, you know, the, the, the Great Transformational Plan and based on my engagements with His Excellency Alan Kujo Chairman Tim, I have very little doubt in my mind that as an economist himself, as a lawyer, as an industrialist, we have what it takes to transform this uh, economy. Mm. And what has been the biggest disappointment for you with regard to how this, this, this government has managed the economy? I mean, there was a recent poll out uh, by, um, is it uh, the um, Afrobarometer, you know, which people, a lot of people believe the economy has not been managed well, about 80% of people. The country is headed in the wrong direction. In the area of job creation, the government has not done very well. From, from where you sit, what has been your biggest disappointment? Well, I think that, uh, you know, to the extent that 
um, they predicated their campaign on the fight against corruption mm -hmm. and resuscitating what they described as a demised economy. Mm -hmm. I think that their inability to fulfill these two have been my greatest disappointment. I had so much confidence in Anad Dankwe Kufar, I, I, I kid you not, that he was going to deal with the issue of particularly corruption. You know, so I mean, how he has dealt with corruption is, is quite disappointing. Um, to the extent that there were some glaring evidence, uh, to the extent that you know people were recorded on on tapes and things like that, and still was unable to do what he was supposed to do and deferred it to the state institution and said, "Oh, but it's, it's, it's the sole preserve of the state institution to be able to you know address these matters." I felt a little disappointed. And also because of how he managed to sort of run the country with his family members. Um, I found that to be a little... Because, look, if we are close that time, I mean, my brother, how can I, do, how can I sack my brother? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So in order to avoid all of that, you don't even bring them closer to you at mm. all. Mm. You know? And so for me, these are the two things that I will... And also job creation and the collapse of the banks, for me, uh, it was the beginning of the downfall of Nana Dankwe Kufar's administration. Of course, I've had countless arguments with people who have given me financial basis for the decision that was reached by government in relation to the banks. Mm -hmm. But I still am resigned to my initial belief, which I still hold, that I don't think that it was a wise uh, decision that was taken by government. Mm -hmm. may have been a good decision, but it was unwise, especially coming from where we came from economically, you know, one would have thought that government would have massaged the situation to create certain balance so that the banks will continue to run without necessarily closing uh, the banks. Now, people have said that it was not really an intention to collapse the banks. It was just an intention to make money off it. And so if you look at how much was owed to the depositors and how much was supposedly injected in correcting the errors which were made by these banks, then it starts to reason that the perception which is out there that you know those uh, the, the, there was a deliberate attempt to steal from from the state is is true. Nine billion. Well, but they, they would also billion. say, I mean, there was an attempt to clean up the banking. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Because there was a lot of mal financial malfeasance yeah. going on within these banks, which yeah. was not helpful. That's what I'm saying. That. So That's what I'm saying. That. that. I mean, this is you know, it's it's a veiled attempt. You know, sometimes uh, when you don't pierce the veil, you it is practically impossible to see what is behind the veil. Now that's why I'm saying that it is a perception, mm. and uh, percep in, in every perception there may be some truth in there. It may not be accurate, but it may be there may be some truth in there, and that is why I'm saying that maybe it was for some pecuniary interest that the decision was taken. Now, was it taken in the interest of the Ghanaian people? On the, on the surface of it, it appears so. But in my own estimation, I am only saying that if you have a 9 billion crisis, you don't go and borrow 21 billion to come and solve a 9 billion crisis. My mother, who was saving with Gold Coast Security, is it security or fund at the mm -hmm. time, was unable to get her money until she died. She's dead, but she has not been able to receive her money. That is the problem. Look at the number of workers we displaced by reason of this singular decision. 6,000 of them. The multiplying effect, I, I keep telling you, you run into millions. So you think that you are collapsing the bank, you think that you are merging some of them, you are consolidating some of them, but that does not solve any problem. Because the problem that you were trying to resolve is, was to make sure that the depositors had their monies. Of course, there will be a few of the banks which were uh, not acting in accordance with best practices, right? Mm -hmm. But that does not also mean that you must bring all of them into the free and collapse them. Some of them were political. You will agree with me. Heritage Bank, for instance, was very political. Your own boss, boss's bank was very political. And so, you know, a beggar's belief as to why anybody would think that that decision was a wise decision. It was an unwise decision taken by government, maybe out of vindictiveness, maybe out of uh, suffocating business owners who were perceived to be aligned to political opponents. 
you know, so that they will not be able to fund, you know, the, the party's activities. Yeah. All of these things are conjectures, but we have been left with a bigger room of without explanation, and therefore we'll continue to conjecture. All right. Uh, we'll have to be wrapping up the interview um, at this time. So, uh, before we go, I mean, to, to those who are watching, I want you to talk to the voter. Yeah. Talk to the voter. Well, um, to the very good people of Ghana, uh, my name is Kwame Owusu-Danso, a lawyer. I am the youngest vice presidential candidate uh, of the movement for change, uh, Mr or His Excellency Alan Kodjo Chemantin's uh, political movement. We are the only party uh, that will be presenting you with an opportunity to experience real transformation. Come December 7th, 2024, for the very many young people who are upset with the system, who have decided not to vote, who have decided just to vote for NDC and NPP because you think they are the ones who are going to come back to power. Let's have a rethink. Let's think about our collective futures. Let's think about what Alan Chematin can present us. An opportunity to dare to dream. An opportunity that this country, Ghana, gave to them when they were young. We have not had those opportunities. So it is time for us to change. We are not changing backwards. We are changing forward. And if we are changing forward, then it starts to reason that the only person amongst the three leading candidates who stands tall is His Excellency Alan Kojuche Martin. He's on number 13 on the ballot. Come December 7th, let's vote for him for real transformation, for development, for growth, and real change. Let's vote for jobs. Let's vote, vote for cash. Let's vote for Asiehoa. Medamunina Asi. Asiehoa, number 13. Kwame also done so. My brother Lantam. Thank you very much. Such an honor. For joining thank us you. here in the thank studio. You. Thank, and, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for um, indulging us. Thank yes. you. And, um, <laughs> we hope that the people of Ghana, your message will resonate uh, with the people of Ghana. Uh, but this will do it uh, for Heart Talk on GH Today this morning. Uh, my guest has been the running mate to Alan Koduche Manting of the Movement for Change, the Alliance for Revolutionary Change. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.